Counterterrorism requires solid, reliable allies. Is Saudi Arabia one of them? Hi, this is Phil Gursky, President and CEO of Borealis Threat and Risk Consulting in Russell, Ontario, Canada, and you're listening to Quick Hits, short podcasts about national security and public safety. When you work in counterterrorism like I did at the Canadian Security Intelligence Service, or CSIS, for just over 15 years, you realize you can't do it all alone. Not only do you rely on domestic partners, and in Canada, for us, that was largely the RCMP, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, which is Canada's federal police force. The jurisdiction they have is to arrest people, lay charges, and go to court, including cases of terrorism as well as our friends across the parking lot at Communications Security Establishment, or CSE, Canada's Signals Intelligence Organization, where I also worked for 17 and a half years for joining CSIS, and other various agencies like Canada Border Services, Canada Revenue, National Defense. Not a long list, but there are other agencies in Canada that can help out from time to time. You also realize that you require assistance from international partners. Now, we in Canada are very fortunate to be part of the so-called Five Eyes Alliance, the Anglo Alliance of Australia, New Zealand, Canada, United Kingdom, United States, the world standard in intelligence sharing. But we also share intelligence and analysis and bits of information with agencies around the world. And I was very fortunate to travel all around the world and exchange views on terrorism, more specifically Islamist terrorism, with partners and somewhere around 75 countries. A lot of air miles going around the world that way. One of those partners that I had a chance to visit on three occasions, I believe, was that of Saudi Arabia. Of course, the dominant power in the Middle East. They've been known, of course, for decades for their oil wealth, etc., etc. But it is a valid question to ask, as 2021 is drawing to a close, whether or not Saudi Arabia is truly our ally when it comes to terrorism. Now, in fairness, the Saudis have experienced their own wave of terrorism over the decades. They've been major attacks against Saudi citizens in the kingdom itself. So yes, they have paid the price from groups like Al-Qaeda, whose original leader, Osama bin Laden, was of course a Saudi citizen himself, but turned against the regime in the early 1990s. And there's no question that we were aided by intelligence that the Saudi agencies did provide to us when I was working in security intelligence. At the same time, however, there are things out there that make you really wonder just how much above board the relationship with Saudi Arabia is. And the reason I'm addressing this today is I came across an article on ABC News in the United States just last week, just a couple days ago. It came out on the 7th of December. This is being recorded on the 12th of December. And it talks about an attack on the Pensacola Air Force Base two years ago, so December of 2019, in which a Saudi Arabian Air Force officer named Mohammed al-Shamrani shot and killed three U.S. officers and injured eight others. Now, it turns out that al-Shamrani, who was 21 years old, was in fact a Saudi Arabian Air Force officer training at the U.S. base in Florida, part of a pilot training program where Saudis learned to fly American fighter jets. There's ties to the American arms industry, of course. But it turned out that uh, secretly that al-Shamrani had pledged allegiance to al-Qaeda. Here we have yet another example of a Saudi citizen who joined a terrorist group, in this case al-Qaeda. What does that bring back memories of? Well, let's look back to the 9-11 itself. The 19 hijackers who took command of those planes, two of which struck the two towers in New York, one hit the Pentagon, and the fourth was crash landed in a field in Pennsylvania when the passengers tried to wrest control from the hijackers, probably aimed at the White House, although I'm not sure we'll ever know the real answer to that. 15 of those hijackers were Saudi citizens. Now, I'm not going to say that the Saudi government knew about the 15 hijackers, although there still is demands by the families of the victims of 9-11 who are trying to get Saudi Arabia to pony up on what it knew and what it didn't know. And these, this inquiry, if you want to call it that, has been going on for quite some time. It doesn't seem to be coming to an end anytime soon. So there are legitimate questions to be asked about Saudi Arabia's role in terrorism. Why is it a disproportionate number of Saudi citizens do join these groups? And even if the Saudi regime itself has to deal with the possibility of attacks on its own soil, 
it has to look in the mirror and answer some pretty tough questions. Like, what is it about our society that is lending credence, lending support to groups like Al-Qaeda, probably Islamic State as well, etc., etc.? Setting aside the decades-long campaign by Saudi clerics around the world to spread an intolerant, hateful version of Islam, sometimes called Wahhabi Islam or Salafist Islam, that has led to the radicalization, sometimes violent radicalization, of people in dozens of countries. And of course, we can't forget that the Saudi regime under Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince, orchestrated the terrorist assassination of Jamal Khashoggi back in 2018 in Turkey when he sent a team to the Saudi consulate to where Khashoggi had gone to, I don't know, figure out some diplomatic papers, maybe his passport or whatever, And they killed him. And they cut up his body into small parts and they disposed of it. Just last week, French authorities released a Saudi citizen named Khalid Aid Al-Taibi, whom they believed had been involved in the murder. But it turned out there was a mistaken identity and he was released. Need I remind you, and you've heard it here on on podcasts in the past, that same Saudi regime of Mohammed bin Salman sent an assassination team to Canada to kill a former senior Saudi intelligence official, one whom I know know fairly well, one with whom I've met here in Canada, as well as in his native Saudi Arabia. The question then is still on the table. What is Saudi Arabia up to? Is it left hand, right hand? Left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. Are there still elements in Saudi Arabia that are in favor of terrorism? Now, we do know that the regime of Mohammed bin Salman has been cracking down on clerics, trying to open up the the society, trying to open up the economy. Lots talk about tourism. There are apparently some spectacular archaeological sites in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia does want to divest itself of relying almost entirely on on petroleum products for its economy. There appears to be some movement in that direction, what I would call positive movement, to try to, maybe not the best term, westernize Saudi society to a certain extent. So they must get credit for that. But why is it we still see a lot of Saudis doing these types of things around the world? What is the problem in Saudi Arabia? Is it truly a historical one? And we're simply dealing with the bits and pieces that haven't been rounded up yet. Or is this still going on? Is radicalization to violence still a characteristic of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia? And as a consequence, should we trust the regime of Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman? Now, he's not the king, but he's he's in line to become the king because all the elders are, you know, all geriatrics. They're all going to die pretty soon. So there's a good chance bin Salman will take over Saudi Arabia. And here's the guy that ordered the assassination of Jamal Khashoggi, as well as the attempted assassination of a senior Saudi intelligence official retired here in Canada. Is that the kind of partner we want to deal with here in the West? Is Saudi intelligence on terrorism that important that we have to sort of turn a blind eye to other Saudi acts around the world? I mean, these are good questions. I don't have an answer to any of them. As I say, on the one hand, I appreciated some of the information we got from the Saudis when I was an intelligence analyst with CSIS. But on the other hand, there's things going on that are antithetical to our collective struggle against terrorism. And there are outstanding questions on how much Saudi knows, when it knew it, and whether or not there is some kind of a nefarious force, if you will, in the kingdom that is still contributing to Islamist extremism. At the end of the day, there's lots of people we can talk to in in, in sharing counterterrorism information. Should Saudi be on that list? Great question. I'm looking forward to an answer. Anyhow, that's what I think. What do you think about Saudi Arabia as an ally in counterterrorism? Should they be trusted? Or can we use other allies in the region? Love to hear your feedback. You can reach me on email, borealisrisk at gmail.com, or on Twitter at borealisaves. You can also find me on LinkedIn and on Facebook. If you like the content want to get more, go to the website, borealisthreatenedrisk.com, hit the subscribe button. You'll get a free daily digest, all the podcasts, all the blogs, as well as a link to my latest book, The Peaceable Kingdom, A History of Terrorism in Canada from Confederation to the Present. It's self-published, available only on the website, although there's now a version on Amazon Kindle as well. Love to hear your feedback, as well as ideas for future podcasts. I'll talk to you again soon. Until then, stay safe.